Hello everyone, my name is Jerich Putra and I'm a marine scientist from Bergen, Norway. Today I'll talk to you about how eating your daily vegetables and fruits contribute to the marine climate big data. At the same time, I will also give you an example of marine climate big data and challenges in this field. So let's get started. The Paris Agreement in 2015 is a major success story for both the United Nations and the international scientific community, where many of the international uh, country agreed to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions to slow down global warming. Now when we talk about climate or climate change, we cannot go far away from the oceans. And one of the reasons that the Paris Agreement is ratified is because of the solid data that we have, showing unprecedented changes in our ocean. In addition to the obvious increase in the ocean temperature, another strong evidence of our changing ocean is the surface ocean PCO2, or partial pressure carbon dioxide. This indicates the carbon dioxide concentrations in the upper ocean. In this plot here, the red line shows that the global ocean PCO2 has increased steadily in the past 40 years, which confirms our understanding that as human activities release CO2 to the atmosphere, part of these are continuously being taken up by our ocean. The red shading represents a rough uncertainty due to the number of data. So what you see here is essentially the number of measurements increasing in time such that we have more confidence in our estimate of surface ocean PCO2. As in many climate change data, the signals shown here represent long-term signals, requiring sustained observations over an extended period. In the oceans, this is not straightforward to do, both logistically and economically. In the early days, in order to collect data into the oceans, you would need a dedicated ship, captain, engineer, chief scientist, and many more ship crews. A dedicated research crews such as that requires long-term planning, resources, and also time. Even though we have more advanced ship and equipment today, the situation is pretty much still the same. Scientists still need to apply for research crews time. They may have to make plan very carefully, secure long-term funding, and most importantly, is time. To give you an idea, it takes about uh, 20 to 30 years for a single research uh, ship to collect measurements that will cover the whole global ocean. Uh, on the other hand, most research institutes would be lucky enough to have one month of ship time every year. At the same time, commercial ships are regularly passing the ocean, transporting all kinds of goods from construction materials, office supplies, used car, to foods, like fruits and vegetables that we eat every day. Many of them are not farmed here in Europe, especially not in during winter time. So as long as we eat our vegetables and fruits, these ships will continue to sail and transporting these goods. And since they're going to be in the oceans anyway, scientists start to find ways to develop new instruments that make use of this opportunity. An automated sensor such as that measuring this partial pressure CO2 was eventually developed, tested, and deployed in many of these ships. So we call these ships our ship of opportunity. This is one of our scientists installing the PCO2 sensor on board one of the ship of opportunity. The new sensor now occupy only a small part of the engine room and many of these ships have kindly agreed to have our sensors there and turn on collecting data when they are at sea. This really changed the observing landscapes. Just to give you an idea what difference this makes, this is a Nuka Arctic ship. It regularly operates between Denmark and Greenland over the past 16 years. So it's quite amazing, even in this kind of winter climate, uh, winter weather, it's still collecting data. And this is located very close to the Arctic. So scientists now, we don't have to be there physically and can instead focus on their time on other data processing and analysis. There are many other automated sensors developed to cover regions outside of these regular shipping lines, which I won't have time mentioning here, but I would like to highlight one, uh, is, which is called Ice Tethered Profiler. This photograph was taken last September under sea ice in the Arctic Canadian Basin. So this Ice Tethered Profile also measures surface PCO2, and scientists have been deploying these sensors in the Arctic for almost 10 years now. With the data collected, is sent in near real time to their home institutes. When we combine all of this data, from
from different monitoring platforms many international efforts with more than 15 countries involved uh, Europe Americas Asia Australia we have more than 100 scientists and more than 40 years of data put this together we have SOCAT or the surface ocean co2 atlas as you can see here it's a huge volume of data both in time and space still you can still manage to see there are many many regions in the oceans where we don't have observations yet so this is when the big data algorithms comes in so the big data task in SOCAT starts with the infrastructure data management quality control and cross validations then we go to the challenging part which is filling up these gaps for this the scientists of SOCAT they use uh, neural networks and other spatial extrapolations routine In the end, this is one of the products that we could end up with, a global map of ocean atmosphere CO2 fluxes. Here you can see where the ocean is releasing CO2, as shown in the red color, and where it's taking up CO2, shown in the blue color. This product gives us the best estimates of how much the ocean is absorbing and CO2 emissions that we release to the atmosphere. You'll also notice that the pattern is quite complex, illustrating the dynamic and nonlinear nature of our ocean. In other words, the map you see here is evolving in time because of the internal variability of the climate systems and also because we humans continue releasing CO2 to the atmosphere. So in order to get an accurate estimate of how much the ocean has changed, not only do we need data over a sustainably long period, but also with, with the good spatial coverage that covers sufficient part of the world ocean. This slide here summarizes how, in the past few years, we have been applying big data to enable knowledge-based decision-making. It starts at the very bottom with hands-on engineers, scientists, and sensors collecting raw data. And then we move up to the second level. These data are then quality control, validated by data scientists and data managers. And then next, the algorithms such as neural networks starts to come in, filling up the gap where we don't have observations relating with the other variables, other data products, and then we create this global product that can be assessed in a high-level global synthesis report, such as the IPCC report or the Global Carbon Project. As you also see, as the data being transferred vertically, there is an increase in collaborations among scientists from different disciplines. And finally, at the very top level, this information is used to guide policymakers when developing future plans. And then there is also feedback from the top level to the international marine observing community. For example, through development of future marine observing, observation strategies. This last slide illustrates approximately the state of our climate observing systems we have in place today. So it's quite complex. It illustrates different kind of platforms that we have and the amount of data that we collect every day. So I hope that my brief introductions give you a taste of the current state of marine climate big data. Moving forward, there are some challenges ahead, and I'd like to mention some of them. The first one is the data itself. Climate change is very dynamic and nonlinear. The best way to move forward is still to observe, get new data, especially toward processes that we are still lack in understanding. We need long-term sustained data. That means data should be continuous as long as possible. And this also include maintaining the ship tracks that we have already established. I know that some of the ship track is being discontinued because the lack of funding. So this is very unfortunate. And then secondly, there is also infrastructures. I think we have done quite a good job here in Europe when it comes to creating integrated data centers, but we could still benefit from better workflow from data collections to science provisioning. And lastly, it's interdisciplinary. With increasing diversity in the type of sensors, data, calibrations technique, quality control, the end user products, I think we need more collaborations among scientists from different backgrounds. And in the end, I think such collaborations will benefit all parties. And also when that because of this, when we develop or when we start planning, training our next generation's data scientists, I think we have to keep this in mind. We need to develop scientists who can understand different languages, who can speak different languages involving different scientific disciplines. So with that, please continue to eat your vegetables and fruits. And thank you very much for your attention.